Hi, it's Friday, the 9th of July, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Matthew's Gospel. And today we're in Matthew chapter 13. And we're just going to finish off the chapter with verses 54 to 58. I think yesterday I said I was going to 58. Nah, I wasn't. <laughs> I was going to 53. Um, because yesterday we had a whole bunch of parables, and that seemed a, a thing to look at. Um, a little controversy. Uh, it's, there's a little distance between me and Jesus, perhaps. Um, yeah, so imagine telling the storyteller <laughs> that he's wrong about what his story means. Um, yeah, I'm nothing if not brave. Anyway, um, so it seemed a good place to stop. And then because there's this little scene here at the end. And uh, I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's relevant um, to yesterday's discussion uh, or to any of the discussions thus far. But I think it stands on its own. And I thought we'd spend a little time with it. So it's Matthew 13, verses 55 through 58. We've just gone through all the parables and stuff. And then this. Jesus came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and J Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all of this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. So there we go. Just that little passage. Jesus goes home, um, goes to his hometown, which we'll assume is, is Nazareth. Makes sense. Um, yeah, if you sort of follow Jesus, um, <laughs> follow through the gospel of Jesus, born in Bethlehem, right? Family takes off to Egypt, comes back, settles in Nazareth, which is in the, uh, which is in Galilee, in, in like in the foothills. Um, Jesus will later, as his ministry begins, move uh, about forty miles to the coast um, along the Sea of Galilee into Capernaum. Um, so Capernaum is sort of his his home base, but not his hometown. Uh, I wouldn't think so. When they say hometown here. Um, they are saying, are not his sister still with us? Is that not, you know, so they all know the family. Um, and yeah, 40 miles is close enough that you might certainly know each other. I mean, Manitoulin Island's 100 miles uh, in length and people in Little Current certainly know and are related to people in Gorbay, no question. Um, but from a Toronto perspective, that's also the distance from Pickering to Milton. And I have no idea what's going on in Milton. Um, and I live in Pickering. So um, anyway, can you tell I might be trying to avoid talking about this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, so this is this would be in Nazareth. And, um, and he comes and he preaches in the synagogue. And they are astounded. Okay, so, so there's no question. They are amazed. And I think you all sort of see where this is going. You know, we're amazed. Except then we start to look at something. Oh, wait a minute. That's... He can't be that amazing. No, I, we, you went to school with my brother. He's no big deal. I mean, his his sister, man, she's the one who who's she's in the bakery. She's terrible. How could it's that kind of talk? And so we suddenly undercut all of this. Um, and <laughs> and that is true. I think from my experience, probably from your experience too. Um, I mean, I have told stories many times about my parents coming to church. Um, to to hear me preach uh, when I was starting, and, and people in my congregation saying, well, there was a lovely couple over there, but they just kept talking, well, that story's not true, that story's not true. Um, as I would uh, tell stories or do things, they would, of course, see their son and therefore not recognize the minister. Um, and in fact, uh, I have found it difficult to be a minister to my parents, even when they came to join my congregation because our relationship is such, it's really hard for um, for them to not see me, the boy who needed to be grounded or needed to borrow money or got into trouble that time and you had to go, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I recognize the truth in that. And, and in fact, it's described beautifully by Matthew that, that way, exactly. They just say, they start talking about how familiar Jesus is and he's so familiar how can he possibly know anything that we don't know? I mean, come on. What are the odds of that? Uh, he can't be all that special. He's, he's from around here. 
Um, and that's, there it is. That's a very human, realistic, I get it. And Jesus acknowledges it. Prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house. Yeah, you can be a big deal away from home, but as soon as you come home, you're just the stinky kid. Um, I got that. But there's two other things going on in this that I think are worth wondering about a little more. Um, the last line, and he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Uh, and I have heard colleagues and, and, and people that I admire uh, within that sort of the church realm talk about um, uh, the inability to do th miraculous things, the inability to be part of healing uh, when surrounded by unbelief. And I'll often quote this. Even Jesus could not do miracles when, when surrounded by, by, by disbelief. Um, yeah, I got it. So there is a, a connection, I suppose. Um, we have to be uh, committed to this. We have to trust in it uh, to let it grow, to let it happen. It does put an awful lot of pressure on us um, to make miracles happen. And, and I struggle with this one because, you know, I have had people, um, I have known people, I have ministered to people, pastored to people who uh, were dying of cancer and praying for a miracle and their friends were praying and their church was praying and it wasn't coming and they kept going, well, I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I guess I, I just, I guess I don't believe enough. And put a lot of pressure on themselves, feeling that somehow they were letting themselves down because they weren't believing enough. Which, by the way, tends to mean not believing properly. And I, I reject that. I don't reject it biblically, I suppose, but I reject it from personal experience. I have seen things that appear to be miraculous. I have seen uh, diseases halted and changed directions. So have you. Uh, and sometimes we recognize those or call those things miraculous. Sometimes we just call them, wow, that was lucky. Um, but we've seen those things happen. But I don't know that I've ever been able to predict it happening uh, or manipulate it and cause it to happen myself. Right? Um, uh, so to, to suggest that Jesus is disempowered when people aren't going to believe in, in him and who he is, Feels disingenuous. Feel, feels wrong to me. Um, not to mention the fact that Jesus is healing all sorts of people with in and around the Pharisees and in the temple, and he's surrounded by massive unbelief, massive disbelief. Uh, unless what Matthew wants to suggest is uh, and that those Pharisees secretly do believe in Jesus, uh, and that uh, and, and that the critics secretly do believe, but they are posturing um, or doing something for political personal gain. I, maybe, but that just seems a bit of a stretch. Um, so I, I challenge that little bit right there. Um, now, the fact that he did not do many deeds of power there um, because of their belief might be that he decided that he just wasn't going to. There's no point. You people aren't going to get it. Um, so that could be Jesus's attitude going, well, you know what? You don't appreciate who I am, so I'm not going to do those kinds of things. Fine, in terms of what you want to tell your, your, your former neighbors. Um, but what about those people who are coming to you wanting help, looking for healing? You, you were, it's like you would heal next door where your friends and neighbors weren't there, but here to make a point, you're not going to help these people. You're not going to drive out demons. You're not going to, you're not going to share the good news of the kingdom of God because, because you want to show the Stevensons down the street, um, that if they're not nice to you, you won't be nice to them. Yeah, again, feels very, very petty to me uh, and not consistent with the Jesus of faith. So, I mean, I know it's just one little line, but it it, it, it unlocks and challenges so many things to me. Um, so as I think about this a little further, uh, and I'm trying not to turn this into a sermon, but there's a connection that, that I, I saw literally as I was reading it. Uh, it just sort of popped out to me in a way that I hadn't thought about it before. Um, 
at the very beginning, he says, okay, Jesus came to his hometown. He began to teach the people in the synagogue and they were astounded. Okay, so the teaching is landing. It's working. They're going, oh my God, I'd never heard it that way. I never saw it that way. They are connecting with the holy. They are understanding God in ways they hadn't before. Jesus is interpreting scripture in a way that is just opening, opening their eyes, opening their hearts. And they are amazed by this. But then, wait a minute. But that's, that's Joseph's son. Right? His mother's Mary. That's, that's the, no, that... That, no, I can't possibly be moved and astounded by that. I would suggest to you that the problem here is they are associating this revelation with Jesus um, exclusively. That is to say, they are seeing things, feeling things, hearing things uh, and in a brand new way for the very first time because of their proximity to Jesus. Because Jesus said these words, I suddenly got it. Oh my God, Jesus is magic. Um, what, what they need to understand is it has nothing to do with Jesus himself. Right? The learning, the growing is, is in their relationship with God which has been uh, at sometimes aided and often um, clouded by all their rules and rituals. Um, uh, so all the things they have to do, some of those things help to bring you into that holy place uh, and to that connection with God. But sometimes they also get in the way because you're just too worried your hands aren't quite clean enough. And then, uh, and he got his hands clean first and I wasn't there. That kind of stuff. They are assuming that there is a vehicle um, a special vehicle to revelation with God, whether that is rituals and purity code or hearing it from the horse's mouth, as it were, hearing Jesus speak. Oh my God, he's speaking and it's, and it's like, it's holy. He must be the son of God. He can't be the son of God. He's the son of Mary and Joseph. And then we discount all the wisdom and suddenly what astounded us before, we have forgotten that we were astounded. They are associating their relationship with God um, with hearing Jesus. And as they dismantle Jesus, they dismantle their relationship with God. Whereas the truth in all of this is each and every one of us has the ability to hear the voice of God. Each and every one of us can work at our relationship with God. And there will be people who come along the way to help us in that. Uh, and they will inspire us and enable us and at times facilitate what we're doing. But they aren't the word of God. Right? They're creating the context in which we can hear, in which we can grow. And it was as if they were getting that at first and then they got confused by, by it being Jesus. So, when he can't do any deeds of power there because of their unbelief, it's not their unbelief in Jesus. It's their unbelief in themselves. It's their misunderstanding how faith really, really works. Faith isn't a thing that somebody can do for you. Jesus can't come and give you faith. That's not how it works. Similarly, following all the commandments and all the rituals cannot bring you faith. It can put you in a place of faith, but the faith work is your work. Jesus can, 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 can introduce you to the kingdom of God, but living in it is your work, right? And I think that that might be the issue. At least that's what I pick up in this. That's, which is why I think maybe this belongs at an end of a whole bunch of parables, because as I have mentioned over the last couple of days when going with reading the parables, I think the parables are work we're supposed to do. We're supposed to read them and wonder about them for ourselves. That's why I object um, to Matthew presenting Jesus, telling us what the parables mean. They mean different things all the time because we have to do the work. So at the beginning of this little vignette, Jesus is his hometown. He's saying amazing things. They've come to the temple, right? They're, I mean, they're in the synagogue. They've come to the synagogue. They've come to learn. They've come to open themselves to God's presence. And it's all happening. And they are astounded by it. That says that in the text. And then they start to look at the person talking going, well, that's 
that's Jesus. It's his mom. His brothers and sisters are all here. And they start to lose it because they're associating what's happening for them with God. They're associating it directly with Jesus. And it's not about Jesus. It's about them hearing the word of God. It's about them growing in faith. Jesus can show them the way, but can't do the work. And as soon as they think he can do the work, well, that's when they realize, well, he can't do the work. He's nothing special. And so the work is gone. They don't have faith in themselves to do the work. I know I've sort of gone around in a circle there and said the same thing twice, but it's, it's a little bit important to me right now. <laughs> And I'm not quite sure why. I have a feeling if I was going to preach this anytime soon, that's what I would be talking about, is how each and every one of us is responsible for our faith, for living out our faith, for uh, growing in our faith. And we can't just sort of expect other people to do it for us. We can't even expect Jesus to come and just, boom, give us faith. Um, no, Jesus can inspire us and invite us to grow in that faith. Jesus' teachings, Jesus' example... Um, Jesus, the event, uh, life and death, resurrection, uh, all of that stuff. Um, that can all help bring us to the faith, but ultimately we will be doing the work. And whenever we expect somebody else to do the work, or we expect the rituals to do the work for us, you know, uh, I keep the Ten Commandments, so therefore things should be good for me. I keep them grudgingly because there are people I like to steal from and I like to pop it. But I keep them all, so it must be fine. When we're relying on those things to do the faith work for us, he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Things aren't going to happen. We are going to hang on tight and trudge forward thinking we're going somewhere, but we're never going to have that sense of freedom that comes in faith. Remember Jesus saying some time ago, um, <laughs> come to me all who are heavy laden, for, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, how many of us who just start, we're just clinging to the rules and we're proving to God that we've got this right. How many of us ever feel that our burden is light? But when we recognize that, that Jesus is an invitation, that all of scripture is an invitation for us to be in relationship with God, to inspire us and help us in that relationship, then there becomes a certain freedom in it because we can read the parable anew and discover something different today than we heard yesterday. We can agree with Jesus's uh, dis, um, uh, translation of the parable, as it were, uh, one day and then the next day not. And it's, but we're free. Uh, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not judged for growing in our faith. We're encouraged to do that. And growing in our faith means changing our mind from time to time, seeing things we've never seen before. Um, that's, that's a dynamic, faithful relationship. Okay, I've now talked around in circles way more than enough. And, and I'm sure there's a couple other things in this little story that are worth looking at. Um, but I'm going to stop right there because, hey, it's the weekend. Uh, and, um, yeah, and you deserve a break. So do I. Um, so I am going to offer a prayer and, uh, and then wish you well. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your, your wonderful, your powerful, your delightful word. May we always work to hear it. May we not be surprised to hear it coming out of our own mouths. May we not be surprised to hear it in the voice of the stranger. May we not be surprised to hear it arise anew as we dare to wonder and think consider all, all that you offer us. Scripture, creation, relationship, our own moments. May all of these things help us hear your word and understand the good news that we are not alone. We pray through the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's it for me, my friends. I wish you a terrific weekend. Uh, I hope there is some growth in faith. I hope there is a, a chance to relax and take it easy. I hope there is 
recreation in your weekend. And if you want to join us for worship on Sunday morning at 1030, well, you can find my YouTube channel or go to the Jubilee website and join our service then because we'd love to have you. Uh, until then, uh, until Monday, God bless you. I know you know what it means, but just let me remind you, God sees you, God loves you, and God's love moves through you. Thank you for being you. See you Monday.